We are wrapping up today spiritual warfare. The sermon on spiritual warfare. We're still engaged in spiritual warfare. That's never ending. So I'm going to take a minute. I just want to recap kind of where we come from. And then I've got one area that's, that's kind of a conglomeration that I want to cover. It's kind of the things that I've missed, didn't get to through the series thus far. So spiritual warfare. First we know our enemy. Who's our enemy? Satan. Then we know ourselves, who also happens to be our enemy. Because a lot of time the devil doesn't need to do a heck of a lot to trip us up because we're all too eager to do it ourselves. Okay? But we know who we are, and if you are a Christian, then you are a child of God. Okay? You are a son or daughter of the Almighty God. You are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Okay? You are chosen. You are a royal priesthood. You're a peculiar people. And I, I gotta tell you, some of you guys are peculiar. <laughs> I know I am. Okay? But then we have to know the battleground. Where are we fighting? Okay? This, this culture, this world that we live in is also our enemy. Okay? Because the, the prince of the power of the air who has dominion over this world, not, not like the earth, he's still subject to God, but over the, the sin that is in this world and those who have not been redeemed, they are working very hard in opposition to us. Don't believe me? Watch the news. Pick any news channel and just watch it and hold it up in light of God's word and you'll see... Uh, you know what? Don't even look at the news. Just watch TV. Watch commercials. That alone should tell you how far removed from God this society is. And, and it's not just America. Okay? So, know your enemy, know yourself, know your battleground. Okay? Then I, I gave you an example. I kind of deviated because I planned on giving the example at the end. But we went into the Old Testament and we took a look at Jehoshaphat and what happened with him when, when he was serving God. He torn down the Baals and the idols and the Asherah poles and, and he was making a covenant with the people before God to walk according to his covenant and his statutes. And then an army comes up against him. And it's massive. It's got three different countries that have allied together to come against him. And so he goes through a process that I think is a good model for us. He immediately goes to God. He gathers all the people and they go before God. God, what do we do? Okay? They go in prayer. But they didn't just go in prayer and dump a want list on God and then go about their business. Okay? If your prayer life consists of, I want, I want, I want, gimme, 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 then you don't have a prayer life. Okay? All you have is classifieds. Okay? So, they waited until God answered. And God told them, hey, they're coming this route. I want you to go up in the morning. And I want you to look out, but you're not going to have to fight this battle because I'm going to fight it. All right? So the next morning they get up and they get the army and the people together. And, and he, Jehoshaphat, actually has the worshipers, the temple worshipers, precede the army and they start singing. They're going into battle worshiping God. And while this is going on and they're getting organized in Jerusalem and they're singing praises and they're coming out, God moves on those three armies. And they attack each other and they, they slaughter each other. 
Not a single one escaped. So by the time the people of, of Judah and Benjamin, they come up to the top of this pass, they look down, there's not a living person out there. The battle has already been won. Okay? Now this is a model for us in how we wage warfare. Okay? We immediately go to God. We pray. We pray. Every opportunity you have to pray, you pray. Scripture tells us that we pray without ceasing. Now, I don't believe you walk around chanting the Lord's Prayer every minute of every day. I believe you have a constant companion with you that you engage in dialogue with. And there are times where, um, you know, Christy and I will take trips up to Missoula. And we'll say just very few words the entire time. We're just enjoying each other's company. One of the, the things that we like to do in the evening is we sit out on our deck on the swing and we watch the sunset. And we don't very often talk then. Now, there are times that we do talk. Every night before we go to bed, I have to know what's the agenda for tomorrow. And she lists it out for me. First thing I ask when I get up, what are we doing today? <laughs> You have your habits, I have mine. I don't know why I asked at night, and I, ask, I guess because I'm afraid in the middle of the night she's going to change her mind or something, I don't know. <laughs> so I ask in the morning so I know how to line out my day. Those, that's a conversation we have every night, every morning. Okay? But you just have a constant companion that is with you. Okay? So we pray. The, the second part of this is, you've got to listen. Wait. For God to speak. Have you ever been with somebody that can't shut up? Motor, 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 motor. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw Benjamin under the bus here. All right, because because he's not the worst. Believe it or not, in our family, he's not the worst. But he went through a phase where actually four of our five children went through this phase, and it was incredible. They did not stop talking. And Christy's mom and dad had come out and, and they wanted to go up to Glacier. And it was not a good trip. About halfway up to Glacier, I started passing a kidney stone. And so I was not, first, I don't like road trips to begin with, okay? So I, I don't look forward to driving anywhere. But to have to spend a day driving just to drive, that just doesn't register with me. That's like saying, you know what? I want to spend the day pulling out all my toenails. <laughs> but I got to be a good host. So I get in the van, and then God says, oh yeah, you got a bad attitude, now check this out. Kidney stone. <laughs> God, help! Please! Christy decided that she was not going to tell Benjamin to be quiet. She was just going to let him talk. From Victor to Missoula, to Kalispell, all the way up to Glacier. And finally, over the, over the sun, through the mountain road, whatever it is. <laughs> Quite honestly, I don't care. Because by this point, I just hurt. I finally said, shut up! Please! For the love of God! Shut up or throw me off the mountain! And then Christy told me later, I was just going to let him talk and see how long he'd go. He would never stop. <laughs> he would still be talking. <laughs> he did stop, eventually. But it was a phase, but four of the five went through that phase. The problem with someone that talks all the time is you know they're never listening. Okay? And if your quality time with God is just you talking, you're not listening. You're not giving him a chance to speak into your life. Now, God will make himself heard. Trust me. You would rather it be the still, small voice than the kidney stone. Trust me. You don't want God to have to slap you upside the head with a two-by-four to get your attention. Learn to listen. Learn to be still. Okay? <clears throat> so, pray. Pray. Listen, worship, worship him, 
The devil hates worshipers. And he will do everything he can to get you distracted during worship. Okay? You discipline yourself. I don't care how many times my grandson is going to throw that car on the floor. I'm going to worship. I don't care how many times people are going to start fidgeting or moving or, I'm, you know what, I'm going to worship. I don't care what might happen this afternoon or tomorrow or next week or next year. I'm going to worship. Lead the way into battle, worshiping. And then the last thing is go. Fight the fight. So, then we moved on to the armor of God. The equipment that God has given us. Okay? Belt of truth. I believe this is sincerity, not the word. Okay? I believe this is being real with who God is and who you are. Not putting on a face, not playing the game, not playing the role of a Christian, being a Christian. Living it out. Being the same in the office as you are here. Being the same hanging out with your friends as you are here. Now, did you notice I switched that? Because normally you say, be the same here that you are there. I'm switching that because this is where you are most often on your best behavior. That behavior should be with you all the time. That should be your nature. Okay? The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The heart guard. Whose righteousness? It's not mine. Mine is his filthy rags. God doesn't clothe us in filthy rags. We choose that ourselves. Okay? God gives us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay? We are his righteousness. This protects the heart. The devil's going to come and get you. You ain't righteous. Of myself, you're right. I'm not righteous, but God has given me his righteousness. And that's far better than my own. Okay? We have the helmet of salvation. Guarding our minds. Being sure... That you are saved. Because I'll tell you what, as a Christian, one of the things the enemy is going to come against a lot is, are you really saved? Christians don't really act like this. You know what's going on in your heart and mind. I see it. That's not Christ-like. Look, Christ didn't come to save the perfect. He came to save the imperfect and make them perfect. And the process of being made perfect, that sanctification process, is lifelong. Alright? It's lifelong. Now, I am not telling you the sin that you're struggling with is okay. You, you know, you're just going to struggle this your whole life. No, you fight. God is not dressing us up in feather pillows. He's dressing us up in armor that we can wage war. Helmet of salvation. Feet. Shod with the preparation of the gospel. We looked at those cleats that the Roman soldiers wore. Immovable. Plant your feet standing in his might. Rank and file. Knowing what the gospel is, knowing how it's impacted your life, and being ready to share it wherever God would lead you. Okay? Let the testimony of your life not be lie the testimony of your lips. The gospel. The shield of faith. And we, we looked at a picture because when, when Paul was writing this, he was actually under house guard. There was a Roman soldier guarding him 24 hours a day. And so he's looking at a Roman soldier and he's looking at all this armament that he's wearing and going, yeah, this is what God has given us. And this shield is big enough that it would cover from about your shins up to about your ear. And you would crouch down behind it. And it worked best 
in ranks with the person to either side of you guarding you and you guarding them. And it quenches the fiery darts of the enemy, those flaming arrows. You know, faith. Why faith? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. We believe because he said it is so. The enemy comes and says, oh, look at this reality. No, I don't care what you interpret as reality. What is reality to me is what God has said. Okay? We live in a world corrupted by sin, but still subject to the authority ultimately of its master. And if God says that something is so, I don't care what the world looks like, it is so. Okay? That shield of faith, working together, being knitted into the body, that shield doesn't do as much good when you wade out into the middle of the fight and you don't have people guarding either side. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the offensive weapon. When the enemy comes against you, and he will, and he does, and he probably is, you got to know how to fight back. The sword is your offensive weapon. When Jesus was taken into the desert to be tempted, that was the purpose of him going into the desert, to be tempted. You notice the devil waited a long time. Jesus didn't eat. He's hungry. Yeah, actually, they say after that many days, he probably wasn't hungry anymore. The devil come against him, and he starts with the temptations. How did Jesus fight? He said, get thee behind me, devil, I'm a child of God. No. What did he do? He quoted scripture. He took the word, and he answered the devil point for point with the word. Now, be careful. You've heard the phrase, the devil quoting the scripture to his own ends. The devil knows this as well. All right? And the devil will twist this every which way to trip you up. In order to fight successfully, you have to know the word. Don't generally know it. Intimate me, know it. Memorize. Read and read and read. Quit looking at chapter and verse. Oh, I got seven more verses to go today. Don't, don't do that. If you need to, get there are Bibles out there. There's an ESV translation that has no chapter or verse. Get that and read it. Read it the way it was written. Well, you can't really do that unless you're a Greek or Hebrew scholar. But the way it was intended. Okay? Read it. Know it. Be familiar with it. When the devil comes against you, have something to answer back with. And pray. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Starting in verse 1. 2 Corinthians 10.1, Paul writes, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, <coughs> being ready to punish every disobedience when your, dis when your obedience is complete. Okay, there are some points that I want to make here. Okay? Because this fits hand in glove with what we've been working over for the last month or so. A couple months. 
We've been looking at Ephesians 6, the, the armor of God. And it, Paul starts that off talking about the might in which we stand. It's God's might, not our own. Okay? And then he goes through and he urges us to stand so that we would not be moved. We would not be shaken. Stand. He reiterates that at least three times. Stand. 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 So then Paul, who is in the midst of having to defend his ministry. Okay? Now this is a church that Paul, through his own labor, has established. And then as God has called him elsewhere, others have come in and they've started turning people away from the gospel that the Corinthians received. And they start mocking Paul. Okay? And you read some of the writings. Read 1 and 2 Corinthians and pay attention to the tone that Paul is using. Because these people must have been saying some horrific things about him. No, oh, he's just a whiny little guy. He's totally unimpressive. He doesn't even have an orator's voice. He's not even trained in public speaking. Some of the garbage that, that he's answering. So he, he answers here, and, and he says, okay, you know, you guys say I'm humble face to face. Well, I, I didn't have need to be bold before, but man, when I come back, I'm planning on being bold. Verse 2. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. He's planning on coming back in boldness. Okay? But then in verse 3, he ties this, this together. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. This is almost exactly what he says in Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers, wickedness, dominion in high places. Okay? So, so he's saying almost the same thought here. It's not the flesh. Okay? We've got to get this drilled into our head. The fight that we fight, fight is not against the flesh. It looks like it often. Because it's people that the enemy uses to come against you, isn't it? Isn't it? Okay? It's the things that people do. Now, quite honestly, I don't watch TV hardly ever. And I, I had the misfortune uh, when we went up to the movie theater of seeing commercials for the first time in I don't know how many years. And I, I tell you, I was so irritated by the time the movie got on. Just the, the asinine things that they put in commercials to try and get your attention. And the stupid things that they say. Really? This is going to make me get your product? No. Our struggle is not according to the flesh. Now keep in mind, it is enacted out in the flesh. But that's not where we're fighting. Okay? So... The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. A fist in the nose is not what God is calling you to. Okay? Nor is it to gossip. Nor is it to badmouth them. Even under the guise of passing on a prayer request. Oh, you really need to pray for this person. You know what they did? This person right now. And all of a sudden, prayer is no longer being considered, is it? So really, what you need to pray for is yourself. Please pray for me, because I really want to tell you what that person did. Okay? The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, the word here for divine, I want you to understand something. The, the, the tense that is used in this word means that it's God's. It's not yours. It's God's. And he is in it, and he is through it, and he is all about it. Okay? It's his power that you are getting to use. It's almost as if 
you needed a ride somewhere, so I came in my truck and let you get in my truck, and I took you where you needed to go. All you did was go along for the ride. It's his power. Again, echoing Ephesians. It's not your might. It's his might. What is this divine power for? To destroy strongholds. Okay? There's a couple things that you need to understand here. The first is this. We are not on the defensive. We are not called to be a defensive army. We are called to be an offensive army. I coached hockey for a number of years. I coached football for a number of years. It is always better to play defense in their zone than your zone. Keep the ball out of your zone. Keep it in theirs. Okay? Don't let the enemy fool you into thinking that he's got the upper hand. He has no upper hand. If you are saved, you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You understand that? And that spirit is greater than anything that is in this world. The enemy is on the defensive. I talked last week, remember, about the French taunter and Monty Python standing up on the wall and yelling down at those guys. And that's the devil. Standing up on the wall, safe behind his wall, he thinks, yelling down at us, trying to get us to retreat. Our weapons are to tear down that stronghold. This word stronghold, this is the only time it's used in the New Testament. And it literally means a, a, a fortified encampment. Okay? This is a military term. The weapons of our warfare are mighty for tearing down those walls. We are on the offensive, not the defensive. Okay? But it's not about us. The second thing I want to show you, the enemy will like to trick you into this. You stand in the power of his might. We're not waging war according to our flesh. It's him that gets this done. We get into battle and we see the enemy start retreating and what's the first thing we do? Oh yeah, look at me. Mm -hmm. I kicked the devil out. And guess what? He just opened the door for him to come right back in. That's pride. When the devil's on the run, you praise and you worship God. You see the cycle? Prayer. Listen. Worship. Go. Prayer. <coughs> Listen. Worship, go. It doesn't end. So then we come down here and it says, um, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, if you look at this, he's actually speaking in two directions. Okay? He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. He's talking about these people that are trying to distract the church. They're trying to get in and they're, they're trying to infiltrate and, and get them away from the things that they have learned from Paul. And he says, we destroy their arguments. When you become a Christian, you don't become an idiot. It's one of the things that I absolutely despise about a lot of Christians. <coughs> they assume that because you live a life of faith, you're just stupid. Some of the greatest minds that have ever lived were men of faith. Some of the greatest minds that have ever lived were men of faith. We have to be ready every moment to give an answer for the hope that we have. Why do you have hope? I don't know. Because I was born a Christian. Yeah. By golly, I'm a red blood American. That means I'm a Christian. 
Bubba. <laughs> you don't drop IQ points to increase faith points. That's not how it's intended to work. Okay? You look at Paul and the, the, the writings that he wrote. He was an incredibly intelligent man. And yet, it was Paul that wrote that we are saved by grace through faith. He, understand, he understood the simplicity of it. Okay? So what, what kind of uh, arguments do we stand against? I'll, I'll tell you a big one right now. A huge one that we have to stand against. How about uh, egalitarianism? There he goes, using them big words. Yeah. I had to look that one up. Now, egalitarianism, in and of itself, I don't really have a problem with. Egalitarianism just means to be made equal. Okay? And I really don't have a problem with that idea. But, see, the, the, the idea now is that there's no differences at all. I find that hard to believe. I can't do any of the things they do on the football game we're going to watch this afternoon except maybe fall down. I can get tackled. I cannot give birth. No matter how hard I flap my arms, I can't fly. God has created us uniquely. He has made men and women. Are they equal? Absolutely. They have equal value before God. There is neither male nor female. But God has called us to different positions, to different places. God has called us to different things. God has called each of us within the church to different things roles. Each of us is gifted in different ways. God has designed it to work this way. In value, equal value. Jesus went to the cross for every single one of us. He went to the cross for every single sin ever committed. He died for everyone. He's no respecter of persons in that matter. His blood was shed for everyone. But God has a different place for each of us in his kingdom. And to be honest with you, you will never be happy until you fill the role that God has made for you. Okay? So, how about this idea that um, two men can make a better family or a, an as good a family as a man and a woman? Or two women can make as good a family as a man. Uh, culture's pushing very hard for that one. Culture's pushing very hard for that one. God didn't make it that way. Simple biology tells you that. Simple biology. Okay? There's an idea out there that if we just make everything equal, if we just level the playing field, all of a sudden everything will be better. Ask Russia how that worked out for them under the Soviet Union. Ask China how things are going for them over there. You know what? You know why China is still communist today and Russia fell? Because China looked at Russia and decided to let the capitalists do what the capitalists do so long as they did it underneath their authority. They opened up their trading and allowed them to start bringing money into the country. Okay? Now this is not, I'm not talking about politics here, I'm just talking about why they existed versus Russia. Okay? It's not equal in position or place. It's equal in value. We go, well, 
my job's not as important as yours. Really, try walking without two big toes. Big toe? What, you, what? big toe? Where, where the heck are you going with that? Maybe you're a big toe. You know, you need both big toes to be able to walk correctly. Maybe you're a kneecap. I don't know where God has placed you. But in order for the body to work right, you have to do the job he's given you. I don't want to be a big toe. I personally don't want to be a mouth. <laughs> but I tell you what, when you do what God asks you to do, when you make yourself usable and pliable to him, then he will work right through you. You become a channel that he can accomplish great things through. <clears throat> we destroy arguments, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, this I'm going to wrap up here. We go from external to internal. I've talked over and over and over again about the battle that is being waged in our minds. This is where the enemy comes against us most often. Are you taking those thoughts captive or are you letting them run free? Do you have a stampede in your brain of all these crazy thoughts that are not scriptural? They're not, in fact, reality? They're not true? Or are you reining them in saying, no, I will not go there. I will choose to set my heart and my mind on things above. I choose to dwell on the godly rather than the ungodly. On the spiritual rather than the carnal, rather than the flesh. I will discipline my mind. Wage war. God has called each and every one of you to be a warrior. Every one of you. There are no civilians in the Christian kingdom. None. Everybody's a warrior. Everybody needs to rank up, to stand firm, to cast down those strongholds, <clears throat> those pretensions, those thoughts, those arguments, and we need to do it together. Trust God. It's his might. It's his battle. He is the one that has said he will cover you with the shield of his favor. He is our refuge. He is our stronghold. He is our safe and secure place. <clears throat> if he is on my side, what can the enemy do to me? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, every time the enemy gets a victory in your life, it's because you let him. <clears throat> because you chose. Now, he may beat up on you for a while. He may taunt you. Loud and horrible, sometimes for a very long season. But God has promised us the victory. We take the long view, the eternal view. One of those things that God really showed me with Cam and Jenna. And I, I confess, I really struggled. I really struggled. I wanted desperately for God to do one of those supernatural, miraculous things, and Clark would be born with a skull. And when I heard what happened, uh, I was awake when, when the delivery was, uh, for about an hour and a half beforehand, God had me praying for Cam and Jenna and Clark. And then about one o'clock, our time, uh, I just, but I just got this piece. Okay. Stop. Go to sleep. And then um, 
Kathy called me the next morning and shared with me what happened. And I, I gotta tell you, uh, in my prayer time, I was, I was pretty frustrated with God. God, your word says, ask whatsoever you will and it will be done that it may glorify my Father in heaven. God, a miracle like this would have brought you incredible glory. They have scientific proof that it wasn't there and now it's there. How can it be but you? Think of all the people. And then God started taking my, my view and he started shifting it a little bit away from my view and a little bit more towards his view. And he started reminding me what I said earlier. There was no loss here. There was no defeat. Now, yeah, Cam and Jenna will spend however much time they have left in this life without Clark. But then they have eternity <coughs> before God with him. Now, my plan would have been that doctors would have been confounded and people would have been, wow, there must be a God in heaven. But honestly, how long would that have lasted? That would have got filed in some file cabinet somewhere in somebody's brain. Occasionally would have been trotted out for the unbelievers. Well, you know, we did have this one time. But look at what happened because of the testimony of the way it turned out. That all those people that saw Cam and Jenna standing firm in their faith, glorifying God, trusting him, regardless of what happened. And now people who had not been in relationship with God are going, I need that. If God could take them through this and hold them like he's held them, and they can still praise him and honor him and glorify him, I want that. So in eternity, whose was the better view? Mine or God's? It kind of makes you feel stupid, doesn't it? We fight this fight in his strength, in his might. We trust him. We trust him. We choose to trust him. Okay, God, this is what you've said. It doesn't look like this to me. But I'm choosing to trust what you've said. I'm going to stand here until you tell me to move. God has an incredible way of working things out. When you're having trouble standing, give your co-warrior a nudge. Hey, hey, hey. I, want, I, I, I like military history, so I'm going to share one thought with you. You know, the, the rank and file, the, the blanks that the, the Romans fought in, this whole idea that we have here? You know what was really cool about this is that the guys in the front, when they got tired, they could peel and move to the back. And the next rank would move forward and take their place. The entire group worked together. And when you're in a battle and you're worn and you're tired <coughs> and you need a rest, let your brother and sister warriors know that they can stand in the gap. That they can help you to regain your footing. That they can help encourage you, help you be strong. Okay? Don't try and do it on your own. You're not called to do this on your own. Father, we thank you. God, that your plans are always better than our plans. That your heart toward us is good. And that, God, we can trust you. Father, that you will never leave us. You are always right there with us. Even when the noise of this life is so loud, we can't hear you. Even when our vision is so cluttered, we can't see you. Even sometimes, God, when we just can't feel you, you have promised us that you would never leave us, you would never forsake us. Help us, Father, to stand firm in this fight, to not give ground, to not allow the enemy 
any victory. Help us, Father, to be firm in our faith because you are faithful. Open our eyes and our ears, Father. Open our hearts and our minds. Teach us to walk according to your way. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name.